Hey guys and gals, welcome to another episode of Mr. GM Fan. Well, today we've got some interesting articles out of the furrow, the John Deere magazine, dated March 1976. This issue's feature was uh, the Farming's Electronic Revolution. So let's get into the articles. Uh, the first one is Electronics Come to the Farm. The top 14 electronic items introduced to the farm are as follows. Number one, airplane mounted radiation detector remotely measures the amount of water in mountain snowpacks. Number two, electronic gin recorder developed by Cotton Incorporated engineers logs activities of important cotton gin functions. Number three, closed circuit television lets Washington dairyman Kenneth Longmire monitor calves' pens from his house. Number four, necessary items for electronic branding of livestock include tiny radio transmitter, battery, implant capsule, and a bolus gun. Number five, this pendulum based system keeps combines level over rough terrain. Number six, Portable electronic calculators are replacing notepads and pencils. Number seven, two-way radios save time and mileage for Lefty Elliott, Fresno, California. These are becoming standard on many North American operations. Number eight, electronic sensors automatically keep sprayers booms at the proper height on this experimental spray rig developed by Dale Cannon, a University of Arizona agricultural engineer. Number nine, electronic rain gauge measures rain in tenths of inch and empties itself during the measuring process. Unit consists of an outdoor collector and an indoor digital indicator. Number 10, the electronic map lets Ralph Richards, a technician at the PTL irrigation project, uh, monitor 21 sprinklers at eight pumps from one central location. Number 11, Automatic barrier sorter optical determines maturity of small fruits, says inventor Fred McClure, a North Carolina State University agricultural engineer. Number 12, electronics control air inflatable valve and gate pipe irrigation system developed at the University of Nebraska. Number 13, laser beams help level land for farmers such as Travis Parker in Drew, Mississippi. Number 14, a USD soil scientist shows moisture sense sensor and amplifier used in an automatic irrigation system. Well, fellows, uh, these are 14 items back in 1976 that were considered innovative. All right, fellows, let's get into the article. Electronics come to the farm. Agriculture has plugged into the electronics revolution and more is on the way. By Kim Allen. North American agriculture is fast entering the electronic age. Two-way radios, pocket calculators, and seed monitors for planters are popping up on farms in ever-increasing numbers. And these are only a small part of the great array of electronic aids already available or under development for agricultural use. For a sampling, see the panel that we had talked about earlier uh, in the intro. The growing popularity of electronic devices isn't difficult to explain. They expand the farmer's range of control and enable him to do a better job more easily, saving time and energy as well as improving the quality of the work or product, says H.B. Puckett, a USDA agricultural engineer at the University of Illinois. Cheaper. While electronic aids have become more useful, They've also become less expensive, thanks largely to new manufacturing technologies and higher volume of production. For instance, one component of a moisture sensor cost $175 to manufacture five years ago. It now costs 50 cents. The growth of farm-related electronics is apparent not only on farms and ranches, but also among electronic firms servicing the agricultural market. A prime example is Dickey John Corporation of Auburn, Illinois. That company turns out such products as seed monitors and grain moisture testers. According to them, we began operations in 1968 with eight employees in a small abandoned building, says Jim Anson, 
Dickie Johns, Vice President for Engineering. Today, we employ more than 500 people in a 160,000 square foot office and manufacturing facility. Dickie John, other firms, and public research have all had a hand in bringing electronics to the farm. What follows is a brief introduction to some of, more, of the more useful and interesting products that we have had made available, as well as, as a look at some electronics technology still under development. Machinery aids. Seed monitors are among the more familiar in electron, of electronic aids. Basically, a seed monitor consists of a photoelectric sensor that detects dropping seeds and transfer the signal to an operator's council. Some models simply tell an operator if a specific row unit on a planter is seeding improperly. Others compute planting rates and acres planted. The seed monitoring concept has led to other types of electronic watchdogs. For example, combine monitors that electronically check shaft speeds often save costly downtime by alerting operators before a potential problem becomes a breakdown. Several U.S. and Canadian firms are developing grain loss monitors. These use ultrasonic sensors to signal operators if too much grain is being passed out the back of a combine. Automatic steering. Electronic technology has even brought new life to the old hope that field machines might one day be guided by remote control. In Canada, T.G. Kirk and A.E. Krauss, University of Saskatchewan, agricultural engineers, have developed an experimental system for hands-off steering of a self-propelled swather. A sense, sense, sensor mounted on the machine automatically guides a swather along the edge of the standing crop. Saskatchewan researchers are also testing automatic systems that remotely guide a tractor from a control center. And scientists at the National Tillage Machinery Laboratory, Auburn, Alabama, have equipped a tractor with sensors so it will follow electronically charged underground cables. Livestock. In the future, cattle may be branded by swallowing tiny battery-powered radio transmitters. Each animal's transmitter would send out distinctive signal, and each could be identified by turning in its signal with a specific receiving unit. John Hatton, an electronics engineer at Montana State University, is working on such a system. We seal the transmitter in a plastic capsule similar in form to a hardware magnet implant and inject it through the mouth with a bullet gun. Hanton explains it ends up permanently in the second stomach of the ruminant. Another type of electronic livestock identification is already a commercial reality. Carton Corbin Jr., a Kansas rancher, has developed a self feeder that records each animal's daily feed consumption. As an animal enters the feeder stall, a scanner records a number from a transmitter ear tag and measures feed intake, Corbett says. Electronic scanning of another sort permits carcass evaluation of live animals. One commercial machine electronically measures the percentage of lean meat on live hogs as each animal passes through a scanning chamber. Another device, a handheld scanner, measures, measures fat thickness and muscling on cattle and hogs. Less exotic are the closed circuit television systems being used to monitor livestock operation. Dairyman Kenneth Longmire, Olympia, Washington, places his closed circuit TV receiving in his living room so he can watch calving pens while relaxing with his family. Another Montana development is a method for remotely measuring the amount of water in snowfall on inaccessible watershed areas. A detector aboard an airplane measures radiation absorbed by the snowpack in areas seeded with a slightly radioactive sand. This information helps watershed managers predict future irrigation water supplies. Portable computers. The computer, long a research tool for agricultural scientists, is now becoming available to farmers in more areas. 
One way is through programs like the University of Nebraska's Agricultural Computing Network called AgNet. Portable electronic computer terminals tap directly into our central computer from any telephone, says Tom Thompson, a Nebraska agricultural engineer. Thompson explains that producers can, can use the computer link up for such things as make up a balanced, low cost ration and then predicting when animals will be ready for market using that ration. With this system, there are almost no limits to the capabilities of on-farm use of computers, he says. The future. It's obvious that electronics will play a larger and larger role in increasing agricultural productivity. But it's also important to remember that regardless of the degree of automation, electronic devices still serve only as a management aid. As one researcher says, and I think this is awesome, people will always be in control and make the critical farming decisions. That article again uh, was in The Furrow, March 1976, written by Kim Allen. The second article that I'm going to share with you is the editor's opinion uh, of the furrow. That gentleman's name is Ralph Reynolds. The article is titled, Why Farmers Quit. Details of the 1974 U.S. Farm Census will soon be available. And though there are usually some surprises in the figures, one result can already be predicted with confidence. The census will provide a, a Definitive answer to the sometimes controversial question, why did the U.S. lose 3 million farmers in the past 25 years? Almost everybody seems to have a theory about this, a question that has haunted the halls of Congress for years, furrowed the brows of six presidents, and evoked thunderous rhetoric from the entire political spectrum, right, left, and center. Some people believe that corporate farming is to blame. Others say that the real corporate is centralization of food processing or monopoly at the retail level. Many charge that big greedy farmers have forced out millions of helpless little ones. Some people claim that farm mechanization is at fault. Weather, superhighways, encroaching cities, and suburbs all have been blamed at one time or another the scapegoats. Many of these have of course influenced agriculture, but none can rightly be blamed for putting half of the nation's farmers out of business. For instance, corporate farms, a favorite target, also have suffered some attrition. Regarding middlemen, a rigorous competition generally prevails in most segments of food processing and retailing. In the long run, this helps both both farmer and consumer. Short of violence, there is no way for big farmers to force little farmers to sell their farms. Farm mechanization didn't drive farmers out of business any more than computers have put mines out of business. And loss of farmland to non-agricultural uses may be reduced, this may reduce the size of farms without necessarily cutting deeply into the number of farms. What then happened to those millions of farmers? The census will offer the most compelling evidence yet that they were forced out of business by the low price of farm products and its brutal effect on the net income available to agriculture. Net farm income, income declined more than $10 billion in the years between 1948 and 1968. Meanwhile, the nation lost nearly 3 million farms. Does this prove that the number of farms declined because net farm income declined? Common sense tells us yes, but a statistician would point out that two occurrences are not necessarily related. And proponents of cheap food, including those who advocate export embargoes, food price controls, boycotts, and farm surpluses would likely say the same. Being loath to believe that there actions can strip away the lands and livelihood of farmers. Cause effect. So just because two variables move along nicely together doesn't mean they are necessarily related. 
Supposing, however, that one of them suddenly changes direction. If that happens, and if the other one follows, you have a cause-effect relationship as neat and direct as a wind change on a weather vane. And undeniably meaningful. In fact, in the late 1960s, after years of stagnation or decline, agriculture's net income began to rise, and in the early 1970s, it increased sharply. By 1974, it had soared to more than double the level of 1967, a year that witnessed the loss of about 100,000 U.S. farms. Did this rising income affect the decline of the, in the number of farms? Decisively. Its impact has, dramatic, has, has been dramatic. By 1970, the rate of loss in number of the farms had been cut in half. And, as the census will verify, the rate of loss was reduced even more by 1974, when less than 1% of our farms went out of business. Estimates place the 1975 loss, if any, at no greater than 12,000 farms. A virtual state of stability for the first time since farm numbers started sliding in 1935. Several years ago, this page contended. So long as farmers' share of national income continues to decline, the number of people engaged in agriculture will continue to decline. What would break the cycle is a revolution readjustment upwards in the value and price of farm products. Subsequent effects, coupled with the 1974 census, will help bear this out. Again, this is the editor's opinion, Why Farmers Quit, by Ralph Reynolds. All right, guys and gals, that's going to wrap it up for this week's uh, Mr. GM Fan. Thanks again for watching. Really appreciate it. And please comment. I enjoy reading your comments. God bless and have a great, uh, great day.